9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the Tech Leap State of Dutch Tech 2022. My name is Christina Collier, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. And I am here live in the Fokker Terminal in The Hague, joined by Maurice van Tilburg. And Maurice, you're going to be our host for today's event, right? Indeed, Christina, and great to have you here with your background as a founder and an angel investor, really setting an example for all of us in terms of uh, thinking bigger, uh, but also paying it forward and giving back. Um, and I'm also looking forward to your contributions from your experience uh, into the panels later today. So yes, um, at the same time, let me, on behalf of the tech team, welcome everyone here. Uh, we need all of you, uh, whether you are a founder, investor, a university policymaker, incubator, we need all of you to think with us today, and think bigger and help us grow. Yes, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody. We all, uh, of course, wish that you were here with us, but thank you for being here digitally. And we're really hoping to make this as interactive as possible. So we've set up a number of connectivity tools in the platform. You should be able to have a Q&A functionality, polling. Um, so already, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know what you're excited to talk about, what you're expecting from the report uh, insights today. Um, and I am already really excited to, uh, to get to it because we've got quite a number of uh, exciting, experienced stakeholders to join us. But why is now the time? Can you just share with us a little bit what the urgency is to talk about Dutch tech at the moment? Well, it's great actually this morning that uh, Sifted uh, launched a, a, a Zoom report on the Dutch tech ecosystem, yeah. uh, really showing where we're doing great, where we're outperforming, but also where there's uh, areas for improvement. It comes at a time when we have a relatively new government with clear plans or clear ambitions. At the same time, the how we get these ambitions implemented is sometimes a challenge. And uh, we think that tech plays a key role. And a lot of CEOs also of tech companies and experts have given their view on how do we approach this together. And I think that's a key thing to discuss today and, and bring to the panels and see how we can make it concrete and actually make it grow bigger. Yeah, oh, I'm so excited to dive into it. I have a sneak peek because I've seen some of the content and I know that there's really a lot to chew on today. Um, so I'm so excited to already have these start these panels um, and also to uh, reconvene after the summit and hear your thoughts and share a little bit of uh, reflections on the day. So shall we get to it? Yes, we shall. And uh, so first of all, yes, indeed, like you, looking forward to all the insights on where we stand today, how we compare to the EU uh, overall peer countries in developing our tech. Uh, and at the same time, it's also let's not further wait and let's get to it. And uh, I would say the floor is yours. Great. I'm ready to go. See you soon. Let me take you to the next chapter. We cannot spectate. We cannot sit on the sideline. We cannot follow their guidelines. We need to act. We need a plan that's impeccable. We are the best of all. We need to think about capital, spending our resources, join forces, stay on course and break down doors. Only then will we reach for more. Because honestly, we are in a race. That's why we need to innovate. That was quite a sprint to get down the stairs in time, and I am grateful I did not fall down the stairs. Um, I'm also grateful to have this amazing group of panelists here with me today. Um, we have uh, a lot of reflection today to talk about on the state of Dutch tech, um, and we've got, uh, I've invited a few really experienced leaders to join us in this discussion, um, and I'd love to introduce our guests. First, I'll start with Janneke Nieset, uh, the, co the founding partner of Capital T, serial entrepreneur, angel investor, all around a amazing person, uh, Dirk uh, Art, uh, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Castor, an amazing health tech company that's uh, started off in the Netherlands and has now scaled internationally, yeah. um, and Constantine Van Oranje, the special envoy for TechLeap and the person responsible for making us a unicorn nation. So this is a, a, great, uh, a great event for you to really be uh, joining us for today, of course. Um, yeah, so maybe just to have a little bit more uh, chat and um, allow our audience 
audience to see a bit more of your backgrounds, I'd love to talk to each of you for a minute or two. So, Janneke, um, we see each other quite a bit, I think, in the ecosystem. Um, I've always been so impressed by your background, and um, you've done some two really major exits uh, in the marketing tech space. You've transitioned to become an investor. Um, so how does it feel being on the other side, knowing you were starting off as an entrepreneur, now you're an investor? What's that dynamic like for you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's the dark side, as people <laughs> I like to say. Um, but I really enjoy it. Uh, as a founder, I've experienced myself how, uh, how important uh, the right investor is for you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have to say, even though I don't want to <clears throat> compare myself with an entrepreneur building our own uh, fund uh, together with Eva and setting uh, up something uh, new in the market and trying a different approach also feels entrepreneurial. Um, but it's especially great to work with entrepreneurs every day to see their energy, to yeah, to really uh, support them, although uh, slightly, of course, uh, in their journey to become uh, amazing. And and yeah, that's what gives me so much energy. I think that it's always uh, great investors that uh, come with this sort of operational entrepreneurial background because it is a tough journey and having that empathy and bringing it to uh, your investment, uh, the support that you bring to your portfolio companies is amazing. So thank you for your yeah, help we, in the ecosystem. We, uh, we tell our founders that uh, we hope that they call us at the end of, the, uh, of a shitty day <laughs> and uh, their friends uh, at the end of a great day. So, uh, yeah. Hopefully not too many calls then. No. <laughs> Um, so Derek, would love to shift to you a little bit, um, and I see the name of your company on there. So, yeah, that's very American, I think. Huh? It's a really big trend to to uh, be able to talk to showcase your company with swag. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I thought I'd make it very clear what I'm representing here. You know, a founder of a, of a tech company uh, at the table, and. Um, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'm curious. So you have this international company. Um, are you? How often do you? How do you divide your time? Are you often in the states or uh, other cities in Europe, or do you spend most of your time here in the Netherlands? Um, well, the last two years definitely spent most of my time here in the Netherlands. Um, I used to go to the states quite a bit. Uh, we have an office there. We have about 50 people in the U.S. Oh, and um, is that on the West Coast or the East, East Coast? Coast? East okay. Coast, yeah. And I have typically one or two U.S. nights to work um, sort of U.S. time slots uh, mm -hmm. to meet with yeah. everyone there. Um, and we are uh, likely going to relocate to the U.S. for uh, for a while with with the whole family. Uh, oh, exciting! Just to also be in that time zone for a while and not have to constantly be adjusting. Um, yeah. Yeah, it it works. Well, if you end up in New York, let me know. That's my hometown, so I can give you a lot of uh, advice on places to, yeah. to eat and, uh, and all that. <laughs> Anything in Brooklyn is uh, more yes, than welcome. Yes, very good spot. Yeah. Um, and Constantine, uh, maybe Hi, shift Christine. hello okay. again. We had a really fun session, uh, was it two weeks ago? We did a LinkedIn Live together. Yep. That was a, yeah, that was, that was a nice on the fly uh, handling all the Q&A. So that was testing my limits as a moderator. <laughs> this is a little bit easier. Um, but, you know, one thing I, I want to say is, uh, as, as people have seen the LinkedIn Live we did together and uh, we've, we're doing this and there's a lot of promotions around it, I get so much positive feedback on the impact that you have had uh, in people's minds on the ecosystem for the Netherlands in terms of raising its profile, um, you know, actually creating changes. So... How does that feel for you five years in now? Um, how do you feel uh, in terms of your accomplishments? Are you able to appreciate them or is it still think bigger, let's go for more? Um, no, I, I don't appreciate them. <laughs> <laughs> Very Dutch uh, approach. <laughs> well, I, I, I think there are, we're on a mission and, uh, and I think you can only appreciate when the mission is completed. Yeah. And, uh, and we're not there yet. But uh, so it is, is sometimes testing to try to find a balance between celebrating and because a lot of good stuff has happened and is happening uh, and also always being the person that has to um, drive forward and say you know a lot of stuff has not happened yet mm. so that is a bit of it's finding a balance but uh, today we're there as well we're celebrating a lot of uh, are still there to film what a perfect segue to the first <laughs> video. So the wonderful thing is that we've got a lot of uh, sort of visuals to uh, share the story and the statistics around the state of Dutch tech. So um, why don't we go straight to the first video that's framing it all for us today. The world is facing serious challenges. Climate change, offering safe and healthy food, broken supply chains, waste and inequality to name a few. We need to take innovative ideas to the next level 
by supporting the entrepreneurs who build companies that tackle these challenges. We need to invest in people that think differently, bigger, faster. Let's look back at 2021 to see how our change makers and the ecosystem is doing. In the Netherlands, 11,000 startups, 19,000 founders, and a total of 145,000 people push the boundaries of our imagination. They build the future of how we move, sustainable solutions to how we eat, and find innovative ways to clean up our oceans. From Groningen to Maastricht, Dutch hubs of innovation have grown on a strong infrastructure of workplaces, accelerators, and world-class universities. Companies like ADN and ASML have made the Netherlands one of the fastest growing tech markets this year. And our tech startups excel in industries such as life sciences, fintech, and food and agritech. No wonder that the Dutch startup ecosystem has grown in value to more than 300 billion euros, is once again ranked in the top three of Europe, and scored fourth on the World Economic Forum Competitiveness Index. Venture funding in the ecosystem has tripled to 5.6 billion euros, representing 6% of annual EU investments, up from 3% in 2019, with more VC funding per capita than Germany and France. And the new phenomenon of mega rounds is giving the ecosystem a boost. The number of exits above $50 million has seen a 53% growth in the past 10 years. And five Dutch companies have raised more than 200 million euros this past year, qualifying themselves, if not already, as unicorns. Though with 359 unicorns, Europe is still far from the 1,222 that were created in the US. And with 1.4 unicorns per 1 million people, the Netherlands still has some catching up to do compared to Israel, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. The number of people working in tech has seen an 8% year-on-year growth and added roughly 20,000 jobs last year. So 2021 was a year of growth. Now it's time to get the flywheel of the Dutch startup ecosystem spinning. As the data reveals, only 21% of Dutch startups convert into scale-ups, lagging behind other European countries, which collectively fall short of the 60% conversion rate in the United States. Conversion from startup to scale-up is critical, as scaling up of businesses creates direct and indirect jobs. With adequate funding, it's time to be bold and take risks. That can lead to mistakes, but those lessons learned should flow back into the ecosystem resulting in more successful businesses. And this is key because when we share exits fairly among founders, investors, and employees, a new and bigger pool of ambitious and experienced founders is created, as well as possible new angel investors that together bring forth the next generation of startups. And so on, together growing a more inclusive and connected tech economy. Let's dive into the three urgent priority topics that need an extra push culture and people, funding gaps, and the opportunities in deep tech. Wow, that's a lot to unpack during this discussion in a somewhat limited time. Um, but uh, basically, it's exactly as you said, Constantine, give ourselves a pat on the back for a job well done in 2021, but it's now time to really kick things into gear in 2022 to think bigger. Um, so for me as an American, this message really resonates quite well. Uh, I actually even have a sweatshirt with the word uh, ambitious on it. It's one of my favorite sweatshirts. <laughs> so maybe I'm a little bit biased, but um, I think that this is the right message at the right time. Um, but Constantine would love to hear you, your thoughts and sort of framing this from an ecosystem perspective. Yeah, so in the end, um, it's all about the entrepreneurs. And if the entrepreneurs think big, then and they they can get capital from beyond the Netherlands. So its capital will, won't hold you back. Uh, your um, the the whatever the government does is really important. But in the end, it's the entrepreneur. So thinking big is is a big issue. The Netherlands is very. Uh, most of us are relatively modest. Also the entrepreneurs. We found actually statistically that Dutch entrepreneurs are less ambitious than uh, many of the, the, the entrepreneurs in countries around us because we like to start business, like to be independent, but to grow a business uh, for most people is a hassle. And, uh, and so we see less of that. So, uh, but that's really the start. If you, if you can't, as an entrepreneur, think big and be ambitious, then no one else will do that and you won't find the investors that will do that with you. 
I'd love to, to pick up on that, um, you know, the, the sort of framing the Dutch founder profile. Um, Janneke, you're an, early st an investor in early stage companies, uh, and you invest in the US and across Europe. How would you characterize the Dutch founder, um, and are there any ambitions? Uh, how would you compare the ambition level, let's say, of a Dutch founder versus international founder? Yeah, yeah I don't think there's such a thing as a Dutch founder. Uh, they come in very different uh, shapes and forms. And uh, there's experienced founders and inexperienced founders, and there's big differences uh, between them. Um, but I think in general, what you see is that specifically at pre-seed stage, Dutch founders ask for less. We see their plans to be equally ambitious, but they ask for less money mm -hmm. to actually execute, execute on them. And I think that's where uh, a big problem is, because uh, to raise a good seed round, you need to have certain proof points. Yeah. So if you don't ask for enough money at a pre-seed stage, uh, you won't get those proof points, and it will be so much harder to, uh, to, to raise a good uh, seed round. So in, in, in my opinion, uh, Dutch founders should for, uh, ask for more money uh, at pre-seed stage and match their ambition with the capital that's necessary to make those ambitions happen. That is such a, a, a really um, insightful uh, thing to say, I think, for, and for the founders in the audience to really take in a little bit um, that there is this risk if you're not ambitious enough and not thinking through actually the capital that's going to be required to get you to the next proof point, that you really are running uh, vulnerable to, um, yeah. Yeah, and I do have to say, though, that um, in general, <coughs> there's not a lot of investors in the Netherlands mm. at pre-seed stage. And uh, some uh, investors tend to say to founders um, that they should raise less money, uh, which I think is, is really uh, wrong, uh, a bad advice. Mm. Um, so uh, I would recommend founders, if they can't find the right uh, ambitious level uh, at the investors uh, in the Netherlands, then find it elsewhere. It's a topic that we're also going to dive in a little bit deeper uh, in the next segment. Um, but overall, yeah, that's an amazing uh, uh, takeaway for a lot of the founders in the audience. And I, I'd love to shift to Derek because you are a founder from the mm -hmm. Dutch tech scene. You have successfully raised 45 million euro uh, dollars, actually 45 million dollars uh, in just the summer last year. Yeah. Um, you started off in the Netherlands. So how do you react to this, uh, this approach of, of thinking bigger, being more ambitious? How do you take that in? Uh, it's um, <clears throat> it's honestly one of my favorite uh, topics to talk about because uh, <laughs> I I speak to a lot of um, starting founders here and I think very often what I see is that people are really happy and, and sort of satisfied when they are doing well in the Dutch market. Uh, but I vividly remember when we had a lot of traction in the Dutch market and we're thinking, um, you know, what's next? Um, how, like, and this is actually going to be a problem. We need to think big. Um, and so I think it's really important that we understand that the Netherlands has an amazing infrastructure and, and support system to grow great startups, but we need to uh, really see it as a launching pad and not a sort of a, a, the, the only market to conquer. Um, so, so my advice would always be, whenever you, you know, think your business plan, you know, use the Netherlands for what it's great for, you know, to prove your, your, your product market fit, for example. But what do you think already very early on, maybe even in pre-state stage, what is, this, what is the story after that? How do I go to, well, to the US, I think is often what you should consider, but maybe other European countries. Um, how, how is this business going to be you know, a billion dollar business? It's probably not going to happen in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And so if you have that plan, and you have that story, you can go to investors outside the Netherlands. I mean, if, if, if we're not willing to put the money in, then, then bring others in. Like a great business plan um, that is so thought through with a, with, a strong, uh, with a strong approach, a strong team, uh, will successfully raise money. So indeed, think big, create a business plan that you know, extends beyond these borders mm -hmm. uh, and leverage what you have here for what it is, but don't get confused that you can actually build a billion dollar company in such a small economy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and also the, uh, um, I mean the investors, also choose the investors that don't demand that you first conquer the Dutch market. Yeah, you know, that's, that's important. Because that often happens. So you, well, first, first you know, grow in the Netherlands, you know, first make a return, you know, uh, become cash flow positive, and then, and then we'll yeah. see further. That might already kind of put you on a trajectory which no longer positions you for growth. And I think that actually happens relatively often. You know, I, I've in, in experienced it myself, and I've also, like you, Derek, mentored a lot of other uh, startup founders, and I often hear that there is this pressure to exploit the Dutch market, to focus on profitability, and I think that's a mindset shift that the investors 
present company excluded, uh, should really take on board uh, in supporting and facilitating that thinking better and yeah. more ambitious. I mean, are approach. you building a lifestyle business or are you building a unicorn? I mean, right, those are very right. different things. We're right? building so unicorns. Like if you want yourself. passive income, then the Netherlands, the Dutch market is great. But if yeah, you really we're, want not, we're not against profitability, of course. No. That's really <laughs> important that you become profitable and that you have a serious underlying business. But balancing uh, it. But it's also, yeah, it's, it's when you want to focus yeah. on that in opposing to focusing on growth. That's a journey. It's, That's a we journey. will also talk about this more. You're doing a breakout topic on uh, how to be competitive as a Dutch yeah. investor, so I think that's perfect for a deep dive. And we uh, also have some uh, more videos explaining, you know, some of the biggest challenges and opportunities within the Dutch tech. So let's look at the first one, please. The people at the core of our ecosystem are the ambitious entrepreneurs, experts in critical IT roles, such as developers and engineers, and seasoned executive teams, all challenging the status quo. Successful founders take risks, think big, and focus on creating value. The mindset is critical for the success of their businesses. While Dutch entrepreneurs are at ease with taking risks, they seem to lack ambition. They put more emphasis on starting a business and achieving autonomy than successfully growing the business. And this is holding Dutch startups back from achieving their full potential. You have to dream big to achieve big. An ambitious founding team needs to be able to attract the right quality and quantity of talent, especially during those growth phases. But this is getting more difficult as the talent shortage in the Netherlands and Europe continues to grow. In the Netherlands, 56% of tech jobs are considered hard to fill, while in the United Kingdom, this is just 37%. Improving attraction and retention of the right talent is therefore key, not just for individual businesses, but for the ecosystem as a whole. That said, the rising demand for talent has increased wages across Europe since 2016. Big tech is actively recruiting and remote working is making the tech scene even more fluid. Countries are also competing amongst themselves for international talent by offering tax incentives and visas. So what can we do? To compete, we must make working at a startup more attractive by making share options for team members commonplace so that talent benefits from potentially successful exits. The problem here is that share options are heavily taxed in the Netherlands. Therefore, it isn't surprising that the employees of successful Dutch tech companies leave the ecosystem more often than in other countries, taking their knowledge with them. At the same time, the tech sector remains unattractive to a big part of the talent pool. The Netherlands underperforms when it comes to gender diversity and the participation of minorities. And this is systemic. The flow of talent behaves like a non-inclusive funnel from youth all the way through to later, more specialized stages in a tech career. We see this phenomenon quite clearly versus comparative ecosystems. For instance, the percentage of women graduating from STEM education is lower in the Netherlands compared to France or the UK. When women do take the step to launch a company, the tech industry makes it harder for them to work in compared to men. For example, when attracting venture capital, women still only receive 4% of the Dutch investments. A mere 16% of VC firms have invested in startups with female co-founders. And this is hardly surprising since 87% of Dutch VC don't even have female investors on their team. So to recap, a lack of attraction and inclusion of new talent exiting existing talent and missing the opportunity to turn talent into new investors and founders are important reasons why the flywheel isn't spinning yet. So yes, we've heard that there are, uh, the market is super competitive at the moment and I think that's only been amplified uh, in the COVID area, era. Um, and there's two areas that, uh, that we see as opportunities to focus on. One of them is uh, making share uh, options more of a necessary tool for compensation um, and, the, and, and attracting the top talent. But that's gaining traction in the Netherlands. But um, in all honesty, I don't think that it's really that standardized here yet. Um, and the second thing that is a sort of opportunity, a real opportunity, is uh, looking at the lack of representation, the underrepresentation uh, within STEM and entrepreneurship of minorities and, uh, and females. Um, so, um, you know, those are, I think, super relevant, super interesting, also a bit 
tough from ta in, in tackling uh, those from uh, an ecosystem perspective. From my, if, in my opinion, it uh, will require a lot of coordination across different stakeholders. Um, but uh, I'd love to start with you, Janneke, and hear your thoughts on the, what are some of the changes that you'd like to see uh, in order to address some of these challenges slash opportunities in the ecosystem. Yeah, I think there's, there's quite a few actually, and I think uh, what you also saw in the numbers is that there's still very uh, large untapped talent pools yeah. uh, in women and minorities, and um, I think uh, it's also a matter of hiring them, uh, not talking too much about it, but just uh, yeah. actually it hiring action. them. Yes, uh, so I think that's, that's one uh, super obvious one. Uh, I think when you look at education, uh, there's also uh, major wins to be gained there, and that starts at elementary school. Mm. Um, if we introduce uh, coding uh, 21st century skills uh, there, then uh, it becomes natural for uh, uh, kids, uh, boys and girls, and um, it's equal opportunity for everybody. Because currently, um, if you have a parent like me, you're fine, because yeah. I know it's important, I have the money to make sure that my kids learn all these things, but not everybody uh, has that. So if you want all the kids to have the same opportunity, you need to start there. But also looking at initiatives like CODEM, where they do uh, educate uh, for uh, the, the shortage we have today, they don't get accredit accredited. So uh, also the government is really difficult in accepting new forms of education. Mm. Good point. So, yeah, there's a lot to win uh, uh, there. Um, and then for the uh, uh, tax uh, incentives for uh, making um, people actually part of a company, I can't believe that I read that it's been delayed because uh, the government thinks that Cool Blue should not be able to uh, uh, profit from that because they are already too large. And that's so Dutch mm -hmm. because uh, Cool Blue is competing with Amazon. Cool Blue isn't big. Cool Blue is big in the Netherlands, but if you compare them to Am Amazon, they are super small. And so f for making these decisions, uh, I think you should look at the international uh, field that we uh, need to compete in and also not assume bad intent, but see what the upside could be if you just uh, do this today instead of talking about it for another year and making uh, an impossible uh, uh, regulation that mm. nobody can actually work with. Uh, yeah, I think those are all really amazing points and really uh, topical. And, and um, I'd actually like to transition to uh, Constantine a little bit, just picking up on that uh, tax policy and the sort of stagnancy we see sometimes in the government. TechLeap is uh, in contact with a lot of the governmental agencies and political parties uh, that could move these topics along a little bit more quickly. So i um, curious what you think needs to be done um, and how do you look at these situations like what happens in uh, delays or deprioritizations around tax policy yeah. changes that could improve the ecosystem. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of momentum now and, uh, because w the first proposal was just about the moment where you actually are taxed so, uh, and, and providing some more freedom there. That was indeed blocked, um, actually not by the government, by, by Parliament, by some idea that uh, it should only work for small companies and not big companies. So it's kind of a fundamental mistake and maybe we didn't explain well enough or the government didn't explain well enough what this whole thing is about. It's about employees participating mm. in the upside of a company. So this is a deeply socialistic kind of perspective. Everybody's participating when the company does well. And it's the best way to, for startups to compete with employers like you know, big tech or mm. you know, other companies uh, and to attract capital, uh, your talent to come here and also retain it. So it's an incredibly important tool. And I guess uh, we haven't explained ourselves well enough how important this is but it now actually gives us an opportunity to not only fix the time of taxation or the moment of taxation, but also the, uh, the percentage, because it's pretty yeah. unfair that an employee pays more taxes than either the owners or the investors over the same shares. Yeah. And, and it's very difficult to explain this. And so maybe um, we hope, and we're going to actually push for this, and we're seeing a lot of response as well in the government to, to now actually fix this uh, once and for all and come up with a very competitive um, regulation or, and fiscal treatment of uh, share options. Love to hear that. Uh, when the, uh, the sort of deprioritization was announced back in December, there were about 25 or so entrepreneurs, well-known entrepreneurs that signed a letter, myself included, that uh, was sort of protesting this fact and, and the need to revisit it. So hopefully that will have some sort of an effect. Um, maybe just a really quick transition uh, to Derek. Um, we're going to be talking about this more in our breakout session around options, but from a founder's perspective, you know, what do you, how do you look at options as a way to incentivize and attract really top talent? for Castor? Yeah, I think it's an amazing tool and um, 
I think every founder should really seriously consider endorsing it. Um, you're asking people to join a startup that's always going to be chaotic. They're always going to have to, to some extent, you know, fend for themselves and figure things out. Um, even if, like, as you offer you know, proper work-life balance, it's still an intense job. And I think you should reward people for for being on that journey with you. Like that's the that's the point. There's uh, there's the upside potential yeah. of of those options. And I think we need to really reinforce that message. Um, you know, starting with education, like. Can actually be part of something and that can have an enormous upside there's risk to it um, but it's not something you can get elsewhere so we should really endorse it and honestly for us if we hire talent in the american markets like we can't go without it it's just yeah. impossible yeah right? in the important. netherlands it's kind of like a nice thing over there it's just crucial and that's that's already sort of indicating how uh, disjointed and broken the system is because it needs to become normal and people need to in the net dutch market go to their employers and be like I want some. Um, I want. I want a part of this company because I'm working my ass off. Yeah. We're going to really. Uh, I love the enthusiasm, and it's going to be a super amazing conversation uh, later on. We're going to be joined also by uh, Frederick, the CEO of SecFi, who has a lot of technical knowledge. Yeah. So all those founders who are thinking about imp implementing as ESOPs. Join us for that breakout session. Um, but to sort of move things along to the next challenge, um, we've also got one uh, focused on uh, the funding gap. So we have a video that's explaining from a statistical perspective how uh, we stand in the Dutch tech ecosystem. So let's have a look at that now. Another key driver to make the flywheel spin and build startups that scale is access to funding. After we're done celebrating the spike in VC funding, we should look at the details. This exposes some fundamental weaknesses in the supply of funding in the Netherlands. First, a few very large funding rounds are responsible for this year's growth. But this isn't a uniquely Dutch challenge. This trend of exponential growth dominated by big rounds was common all across Europe. However, the early stage funding gap in the Netherlands got bigger. At its base, Dutch tech became less well-funded in 2021. The number and quantity of early stage investments remains low, making it harder for startups to grow. As the Dutch startup ecosystem is growing, the number should increase considerably, but it's not, thereby choking the supply of new startups and technologies entering the market. If we look at how the money enters our ecosystem, we observe that much of the early risk is taken by Dutch public and private investors, and the value is captured by foreign investors in the later stage rounds. Typically, Dutch investors are looking for mature proof points and are moving to invest in later stages and investing outside of the Netherlands. The collective effect has amplified the funding problem of early stage startups. With some of the largest pension funds in the world, the Netherlands could be a leading force in venture capital. However, pension funds and other institutional investors still only invest 0.01% in VCs and VCs on average only participated in a total of 100 million euros in deals. This is perplexing because the high returns of VCs and the impact startups are making on massive societal transitions are very much aligned with pension investment goals. Finally, the Netherlands should improve its community of angel investors. As of right now, we're already leaving a potential of more than 600 million euros of investments on the table. A quarter of angels mention potential taxation as too high, as investments aren't actively supported through fiscal or other measures. A lack of support for angel investors not only reduces the flow of early stage capital, it also means that knowledge, experience, and networks of operator angels are not shared. And thus, the much sought after flywheel does not spin. So I, I didn't find those stats too surprising, um, especially around the early funding gap. Um, I'm part of a, a, an angel group called Operator Exchange, and it's really fueled a lot by empathy for the founder experience and this desire to give back from a capital perspective and a knowledge perspective. Um, you know, on the tax incentives point, uh, I, I see that there's a lot of other countries that do well in terms of uh, they've created great policies for tax relief, such as Sweden, France, UK, um, Germany. And I think if we were able to adopt some of those policies that um, that would actually stimulate angels to invest more, not necessarily to invest. These are people who are already investing and uh, having some form of tax relief would allow them to increase the budget that they allocate to their startup portfolio. Um, but um, so that's, you know, from, from my perspective on the angel side, which really does the very earliest checks in many cases. Um, but Derek, you have uh, really, you're, you're a great shining star in terms of how to navigate the funding process. You start 
started your company in the Netherlands. Um, you've now scaled internationally. You mentor other uh, founders. Um, what's your advice on how to navigate this early stage funding gap in the Netherlands? Um, well, I think, uh, again, start with having a great sort of business plan and validate that. Uh, I, I think if, if you consider your only market the Netherlands, then you're going to have a problem. You need to look at also competitors internationally. So I think that is, that is very important. Again, I think if you have an amazing plan and an amazing team, investors will come, the angels will be like, tax, you know, who cares about tax? You know, <laughs> it's like the upside is just inc incredible. So again, I think that is, that is critical. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, use these networks that, that we have here, you know, people like Janneke, um, people like you actually, um, you know, who are really well connected, and, uh, and get some help, you know, get some, uh, get some help, you know, find someone like me, so how, how did I start? Um, there's so many ways to, um, to find angels, to find, you know, pre-seed funds. Pre -seed funds. Um, I think it, it all starts with, with, again, thinking big, having the right plans, and then being very deliberate. Just be very deliberate in who you reach out to, who you network with, mm. um, and, and let them help you get access to the right people who, who believe in you and who believe in your story. And I think earlier you also said, you know, don't be afraid to look internationally uh, for investments, even at the seed stage. Um, and I think that's a, I'd love to hear Janneke's point on that. Um, how do you, as a Dutch-based VC that does international investments, how do you see the competitive landscape for VC investors here in the Netherlands? And do you see internationals as uh, competitors or collaborators? What's your approach with Capital T? Um, yeah, I want to make one comment on the on, on the Derek's point Please. because um, I think uh, you do need to have a great plan. Um, but it's also true that the funding gap uh, exists for women and minorities, and a great plan is not always enough. That's really true. So we true. need to yeah. continue to be aware of the bias that's in the system and the lack of uh, female and uh, minority uh, investors. Thanks for who, making that point. Uh, yeah, who emphasise that? So. Um, yeah, and and I would like to join that certain categories of companies, and we'll come to that on deep tech, mm. yeah. obviously require much more funding in a stage where, where there's still a big technology risk and it will be very difficult to find people that don't that just want a financial return. You yeah. have yeah. to find people that have the, that share the vision as well. Yeah. yeah, very true. But in terms of the uh, competition, I think it's truly great that international VCs uh, come uh, to the Netherlands uh, and to Europe in general. It shows the potential that's here and the excitement uh, uh, about the companies that are being built here. So I think that's all great news, and I also like uh, working with them. Uh, we try to cooperate with them uh, when we can. Uh, and I like the fact that they make um, Dutch VCs uh, uh, up their game. Yeah. Um, I think there's still, so, still some practices in the Netherlands, like milestones and ridiculous uh, liquidation preferences that are not uh, of this time anymore. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, having an outside a force to uh, remove that from the ecosystem, I think is really uh, mm. important and uh, great because now uh, through these ridiculous terms, sometimes you just put up uh, entrepreneurs for a disaster. Yeah. And, uh, and that should never, ever be the role uh, I hear of that an often. investor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a, a nice spot for, to position our founders for success. So, yeah. um, no, and working with them also means uh, a different network, an international yeah. network. So we actually are really happy with the international VCs uh, in Europe. Great, a, a nice model for other Dutch VCs to, uh, to try to aspire to. Um, I want to just shift quickly before we, do, we move to the next topic on, on to pension funds, because I thought that was a really interesting statistic, 0.01%. And with interesting, you mean horrible? Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's my American euphemistic no, way of saying uh, horrible. Euphemistic, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, Janneke, I mean, you deal with uh, LPs all the time, uh, and did you raised 50 million, I, I believe, with yeah. capital T. So well, how do you see this? Is it an opportunity for the pension funds? No, it's definitely an opportunity. It's uh, it's it's a missed opportunity mm. that they uh, don't always already uh, join. They can really contribute to the uh, big shifts uh, that we're trying to make uh, and the big uh, also issues we're facing and uh, the transitions we need to go through. They can really contribute uh, to that. Uh, so I, I, for me, it's really difficult to grasp that they don't put uh, more. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, the fact that every other country is is doing it, doing that, and uh, well, and and the upside they can create um, yeah. for themselves, but also for the country and the ecosystem, it's just a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's 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 really weird to see that um, Dutch VC find it nearly impossible to raise with Dutch LP. So you have mm -hmm. family offices and so, but the institutional investors are just not there. 
And you imagine that if they would invest, if they would only invest 1%, the Netherlands would have been the biggest VC market in Europe. And it's, uh, so it's just, it's not only a lost potential in investing in companies. So, and we're saying, you know, all these, in, all these transitions in energy and food, yeah. logistics, all the stuff that we really want. And that's what's drive, you know, driven by these, uh, by these companies, but also the VC sector itself. Uh, and, and it's also not only by investing in Dutch VC, but also other European VC, American VC, and becoming an active LP in, in that asset class. It's just a, it's just, it's a kind of a no-brainer, but it's been one that's been very hard to solve. We've got a medic here. Maybe we can, uh, <laughs> maybe you can do diagnostics and some, <laughs> some kind of medication, why, uh, how we can actually um, get them to participate as well. And there are a few... There are a few examples like MN and APG that are kind of stepping into this space, mm. but still, still very limited. Baby steps. Hopefully, this is a sort of uh, you know call to action for those in the pension fund industry. Um, and and I'm curious also though if there's the ability to look to pension funds in other countries as well. If uh, yeah, I mean Sweden has been has been incredible the amount of pension money going in. And then we if you look at endowments in like the Yale endowment in the U.S. What they're doing that a really a significant part is invested. In, in VC and it's done really well for them. Hmm. That's uh, well, hopefully in the next year's uh, look back, we'll be able to have some traction above that 0.01% investment. <laughs> um, but so it, uh, I would love to transition to our next topic because um, there's quite a few opportunities for us in Dutch, in Dutch tech. And the next one is focusing on deep tech as an industry to, uh, to really support. So let's have a look at the video. Currently, one of the star sectors in tech is deep tech. When we talk about global challenges, Dutch solutions, we're in fact mostly talking about deep tech. These are the companies that create revolutionary technology, solve real problems for society, and base their work on hard science. We're talking about the next ASMLs, Unilevers, and Philips developing new vaccines, new energy solutions, climate-resistant foods, bio-based chemicals, the next generation of chips and computers. And they're locating themselves close to tech universities in Delft, Twente, Eindhoven, and Wageningen. The Netherlands is well-positioned to be a leader in deep tech, with an excellent scientific basis, filling more patents per capita than France and the UK, with many patents in groundbreaking tech fields like quantum technologies. A culture of collaboration and an extensive system of more than 100 support programs for startups, guiding entrepreneurs through the incubation period. Though their development is timely and costly, deep tech startups have intellectual property and assets to defend a market position for the Netherlands. That's why it's so pressing that the funding gap is particularly tough for these businesses. Other countries are outperforming us, and the impact and economic value of Dutch deep tech remains untapped. You can see this clearly in fields such as quantum computing, where the Netherlands is in the early stage of startup activity, whereas US businesses are already raising hundreds of millions. But it isn't only funding holding deep tech ventures back. Dutch deep tech startups need higher ambition to succeed, with serial entrepreneurs leading the way. Many first-time entrepreneurs face a very steep learning curve. Founding teams are often more focused on science and technology than on market developments and growing their businesses. Teams lack diversity in skills, gender, and backgrounds to solve a wide variety of obstacles. They get stuck in the tech transfer system with its IP rules, disincentives, and university politics. A first priority should be creating the best possible environment and infrastructure for product and business development. Currently, the tech transfer support system would benefit from more shared open R&D infrastructures, better coordination, and more professionalism. A second priority should be to ensure that tech transfer enables scientific entrepreneurs to build their experience and entrepreneurial skill set. As of right now, there's a shortage of repeat entrepreneurs in the scientific community, and we lack seasoned senior executives that know both the tech and aspects of finance and business development. The momentum for change is growing with new private and public deep tech funds and programs like the Faculty of Impact and Science to Impact. We might just be ready to build one of the strongest deep tech sectors in Europe if we can go from science to global impact. 
Deep tech. Now, I find this to be such a fascinating sector. Um, it can be intimidating for folks, though. Uh, but Derek, you are a shining example for deep tech. So I would love to uh, hear a little bit about your own personal experiences and best practices for the tech transfer office um, and academia. That, what do they need to adopt in order to best support and position our deep tech startups for success? Yeah. I think this is a very important topic, and I was just telling you how this video got me all agitated, because <laughs> oh, no. I remember vividly <laughs> my years in, in academia, so I did a PhD after I studied medicine, and um, I actually built a, uh, a solution to help uh, physicians make better decisions about patients, and we were working with a commercial partner um, there, and um, I was pushing, because I, I already had a little business on the side, I, uh, Gastro had already started, was my little side project, mm. I was pushing to say, hey, maybe we can spin this out, because I was looking at the US, and I knew like, half the funding I think from around, you know, a big percentage of funding from the universities comes from the startups that have spun out um, of there. And it's, I yeah. think it's a very healthy sort of positive spiral. So I was saying, um, you know, maybe we can put this in a BV or we can sort of spin it out, turn it into a real company, have lasting impact. Um, and it was just like, no, no, you know, that's difficult. And, you know, we can't make money. If we make money, it will, uh, you know, it will look weird. So I was like, but we need, a, we need a business model, right? How can we sustain innovation without a, without a business model? How can we have global impact, like we said in the movie, without actually thinking about how we're going to bring it beyond our borders uh, as a company? And sort of all my experiences in academia have been really this attitude of like, oh, no, you know, we'll just focus on the science and let others do the work. No, that's, mm. that's not how it works. Like writing papers does not actually solve the world's problems. You need to turn it into action. And also just later in stage, when I've, because I continue to work with academia, I think it's very important to have a link between you know the business life and academia, I have a PhD student who's graduating in um, in three months, uh, defending his thesis. But just working with the university is so hard because they come to you and say, "Oh, as soon as someone um, starts working with us, like together, we're going to claim the IP." And yeah. at some point, I said, "Like, you yeah. know what? We'll just pay him ourselves. We're not working with you, not officially. Yeah. So we'll work informally." It just blows your mind. Like it makes it so unattractive. Yeah, I mean, um, it's also really difficult because that that takes away the incentive for this long journey yeah. that many founders are going on, and uh, exactly. it's a challenge. And yeah. last thing I want to say about this, like we get invited into a ton of proposals. Like people love having us in their like big grant proposals. We actually yeah. secured a huge grant of a million uh, earlier in in uh, 2017. But we cannot actually receive um, you know, any of that money. So it becomes very unattractive for us to participate because we need to basically participate for free. Uh, because, you know, or we have to find some really complicated, convoluted structure um, yeah. to participate in like, this public-private uh, collaboration. And it's just mind-blowing. It's creating a lot of roadblocks, clearly. Yeah, well, it just makes yeah. it extremely unattractive. Even yeah. for me, who has such deep ties to academia, I'm like, you know what, maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe you do this one on your own. Because it's... The, the, the ecosystem is really lucky to have you to share those learnings and to try to guide you know, founders how to navigate and hopefully uh, these tech transfer offices as well, your feedback exactly. will be helpful. Um, but Constantine, maybe just a, a really quick uh, reaction for, from your perspective. Like, what are your thoughts on the Netherlands' ability to compete given that so much uh, capital in the, the other countries such as the States is going towards deep tech? How do you look at it for us? Yeah, so we have a growing um, venture capital sector that's focusing on deep tech, but it's still pretty small. Mm. And uh, and all of the, the, the points that Derek raised are really relevant. And I think if you if you take, uh, if I now take a more government perspective on this, uh, and also perspective of the universities, uh, you have to look at what you want to achieve. So if you do want to achieve uh, sizable businesses that are successful, you have that's the perspective you have to take. It's not pushing more science. That's really important. Invest in science, you know. But if you want to transfer that science into the business, you then have to step to the other side and look back. So what do I need? What uh, what do these uh, these scientists need? What do the entrepreneurs need? And and maybe also look around where this has actually been solved to some degree because it's mm -hmm. complicated. We understand that. And uh, and Leuven has a very good uh, proposal. They actually took the Cambridge model as one of as their key example. We know in Switzerland that has been uh, they have been solving some of those issues. Um, Boston obviously has a good reputation, MIT, uh, also Stanford University. So there are solutions there. And what's holding us back is really a culture, uh, a culture which says that entrepreneurship and spinning out business is really cool and is something that belongs to a university practice in which the university is one actor, but there are other actors like investors and then, you know, and, and there are and even the city because there's real estate involved and stuff. So yeah. all of that. And, um, and, and you have to be proud of the business that come out and not because somebody, you know, is spending a lot of research money that often is public in the beginning and then actually takes it private and becomes successful. That that's a bad thing. We should mm -hmm. celebrate it and then make sure that 
the you know the money exactly. starts flowing back into science, into business, yeah. into people that uh, will fuel the next round because that's where the impact's made. I think that's a really interesting uh, consideration also in standardizing a bit, you know, these commercial approaches uh, and when these university spin-outs happen so that there is this sort of equal distribution and uh, value and that not only do the founders achieve success but the universities and that can sort of fuel future programs and hopefully future yeah. spin-outs. One really short note yeah. um, because I know we're running out of time but uh, f f from us, from an investor perspective, uh, at Series A, the founders still need to have uh, at least 50 percent. So yeah, uh, universities yeah. should consider if they already take a large chunk like really early on mm. that you will never uh, be in that situation at Series A and that then it's impossible for the company to raise uh, future This realms. is such we an important this, yeah. point. It so many really companies important. get stuck because of their, uh, their funding structure yeah. and, and one of the most essential things is give the founder control. Yeah, I, I have to say, we uh, we see a lot of uh, deep tech startups in, through Operator Exchange looking for their earliest uh, funding rounds, and we oftentimes will say no because we see that 25 to 30 percent is already going to the university in that earliest stage, and we just realize that dilution is going to be very demotivating over time. So uh, a good call to action for the uh, Tech Transfer Office. I know TechLeap is already doing some work to try to create... Uh, yes, and the universities with the, the impact, Science to Impact are, are really engaged, and, yeah. uh, and we're seeing hopeful trajectory there. Uh, great. Um, wrapping up this topic, we will be di diving deep into this also in a breakout session. So those of you who are interested, please join that one. Um, and I would, uh, I think we all know that government also has quite a role to play. Um, we are really excited that Prime Minister Mark Rutte has uh, recorded a message. Uh, so why don't we have a look at that and see what he has to say. Can I Hello, everyone. <laughs> no. With the pandemic raging, 2021 was a challenging year for us all. But despite the difficult circumstances, the Dutch tech sector still managed to make it a great success. We saw a tripling of investment, even more unicorns and an 8% rise in new jobs. Those are achievements to be proud of and perfect proof of the power and resilience of the Dutch tech sector. That's good news for all of us. Because startups bring innovation to the market create future jobs and help safeguard our strategic and technological autonomy. In the long term, startups and scale-ups can help us make essential transitions in areas like climate change, sustainable energy, digitalization and the circular economy. So it's clear that technological enterprise is shaping our future. That's why I'm proud to be speaking to you today as a strong supporter of the work TechLeap and its partners are doing. But I know that government has a job to do too. The Netherlands is well placed to become one of the best countries in the world to start and grow a tech company. We just need to go that extra mile to unlock our full potential. That's why we have specific plans to educate more people to work in tech and will be investing more in R&D. We've also appointed a dedicated state secretary for digitalization. So I can assure, assure you, government will play its part in ensuring a vibrant, inclusive and groundbreaking Dutch tech sector for a sustainable future, together with all of you. Amazing. So we've heard from Prime Minister Rutte that he realizes the potential for the ecosystem and the important role that government has to play. Sounds like he's committing uh, to uh, supporting that. So we've got it on videotape. <laughs> Um, and we also actually have a message from TechLeap's key partners, uh, another um, key group within this stakeholder uh, of the ecosystem. So let's have a look at that video as well. We celebrate our success, but we also sense the urgency to push harder to get the flywheel spinning. More startups growing into scale-ups, exiting and creating new founders and investors, attracting more diverse talent into the tech sector to develop and build the Dutch solutions to the hardest societal and environmental challenges. The time to act is now. We're in the business of taking leaps. Are you ready to think bigger and take the leap with us? I commit to providing the best mentoring and connections for startups. Hi, this is Corinne from TomTom. I pledge to keep investing in the local uh, use for the local tech job with Coda, to keep investing in the uh, tech community as I've done so far, 
And I've no doubt that uh, next European Tech Giant will come out of Holland. And thank you, big shout to TechLeap and team for all the work they're doing to keep the ecosystem together. At Innovation Industries, we commit to help founders to accelerate their business. We've got the brains, we've got the ideas, we've got the entrepreneurs for successful startups and scale-ups in the Netherlands. And I, I will make effort to invest Dutch pension money in those ventures. I commit to have a big impact on the planet by thinking big. I commit to a competitive shareholder regime and want to work on early stage funding. The universities of the Netherlands are fully committed to make science to impact a success. BOM, the development agency of Brabant, is one of the largest providers of risk, capital and support to startups in the deep tech sector in the Netherlands. Join us. It's not only rewarding, but it's also essential for the strength of our economy now and in the future. I call on all the banks to continue to ignore startups. Why? More business for BAM. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Let's get together and make the Netherlands the best place for tech entrepreneurs. We can do this. <laughs> I love the energy at the end of that. Um, Constantine, so we've heard uh, the ambition of Prime Minister Rutte and our key partners. Um, I'm curious, what is TechLeap going to do? But first, we're going to ask our audience to be a little bit interactive, and we've got a poll that um, you can respond to while Constantine is, um, is giving us his answer on what TechLeap will do. Uh, so the question to you, the audience, what should TechLeap be doing? <laughs> Constantine, what will TechLeap be doing? So yeah, we're, we're actually shifting a bit from a problem-oriented organization that kind of identified the bottlenecks that we are addressing, and we have, we will continue doing that, obviously, but to, to engaging much more with the community, because we believe that when there's a strong entrepreneur's community that's supporting each other, we need less support of external uh, parties. Mm. I think most of the knowledge about the tech, uh, you know, tech system, about building businesses, investing in business is actually with the entrepreneurs. So mm -hmm. we need to have more knowledge sharing among them. We will be providing a lot of uh, data. So we're building a dashboard as well so that we can actually monitor what's going on in the Dutch ecosystem on a daily basis. Um, and that will be delivered this year. We will continue, obviously, on the share options until they are there, and we Great. want a kind of a, an early stage, uh, kind of, of, of kind of a fiscal guarantee uh, rule for early stage um, investment. Uh, that's something that we really will continue to work on, and then diversity. I think diversity is a really uh, challenging yeah. uh, topic. Uh, it's not only with, not always within the scope of TechLeap because a lot of education there as well, but we think it's highly strategic for our uh, successful scale-ups to have an open, diverse culture, because that's the only way that you'll attract the right um, people, the uh, right talent, but also the right number of talent. Because once you're growing internationally, you will have to also employ people from other countries, you know, speaking other languages. And then if you have a very monocultural uh, situation within your company, you just will not succeed. So yeah. it's something that is highly strategic. Diversity is highly strategic and important. But also societally speaking, uh, if this tech sector is growing and much more jobs will be tech, it's just unacceptable that, uh, that um, big slices of the community, you know, women, but also minorities, are, are not included in that development. So we need to really close that opportunity absolutely. gap. Absolutely. Yeah, yep. yeah. And I think one of the first things uh, that's necessary is also the scope of data around, you know, diagnosing the problem. I think on the gender side, we have... Uh, we're starting to get more numbers around yeah. uh, funding and uh, representation within yeah. STEM. Uh, from an ethnicity perspective, that's something that a conversation that's needs to happen. Absolutely, need more data. Yeah. And then finally, obviously, deep tech. If we really want to achieve all those transitions, uh, it's not going to be the universities. It's not going to be the, only the big companies or the government. It's actually going to be startups that are going to drive these disruptive changes that we want. And uh, therefore, we need to invest more in them. So deep tech is going to be one you know, very important part of our agenda. You heard it here. Uh, I can't quite read the answers to the, what TechLeap would focus on. So maybe Dirk or um, Constantine can share that so from the audience. It looks like the biggest <laughs> category is early stage funding with 24.4%. Uh, and I think uh, share options regulations is the second biggest one. With uh, actually no others. Is <laughs> Other. That's yeah, a really uh, interesting it, it category. It looks like they want you to focus on a lot. Oh wait, of stuff. it's still changing. Yeah. It's still changing. Uh, well, we'll maybe have uh, towards the. No, end but it's of this, pretty clear. Uh, you know, yeah. share options. It's it's yeah. early stage. It's diversity. You know, this is the topics that it's we would typically also. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that's great. You know, that means that's great that endorsement. 
the, the great thing that it means that it's very you know, reflective of what uh, the topics that we're highlighting today are really reflective of what people think the ecosystem needs to focus on. So TechLeap is, in a, a, is already uh, at the forefront if you're diagnosed those, those issues already. So that's great. Um, and, and since we're making uh, uh, calls today uh, yeah. of action to, um, to different uh, parties because. in the ecosystem, I, I, I would like to also make the call to action to TechLeap to uh, not focus on ending in like one or two years. Oh, right. yes. um, I think we need TechLeap for the next at least 10 years, so maybe we can start making plans for that. And maybe in a, perhaps a different form. I know it's <laughs> sort of evolved into TechLeap. It could evolve into something new after that, but I, I agree. I think, yeah, I think it's a very important element. Yeah. And I think it has really driven This was not system. scripted. No, no, no. No, no, <laughs> no but I agree too. It's the same. Like yes, yeah. <laughs> it would be such a pity if it would stop in a few years. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the, the, the uh, having a sort of complementary approach of creating these ways for founders you to sort of to serve. want me to leave the table? <laughs> <laughs> no, you keep trying to go. No, you got to stay here for one more minute. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, you, you have done an incredible job uh, over these last two years, and I'm sure will continue to do in the, the last two years of the current iteration. Um, and it will be great to see how you're able to, you know, connect the ecosystem to each other and create these sort of peer networks uh, for this knowledge transfer. Um, so I'm excited for that next iteration. Um, we technically were going to do one more poll. Um, I think we did it. Uh, oh, yeah. wow, great. So, will you so the question to? to the audience was, what will you commit to? Uh, Constantine, can you, or Derek, can you see the... No, go ahead. Look, again, okay. it looks Up my game, needed. thinking bigger. That's, uh, that's the... the uh, and then the other big category is uh, help turning science and technology into successful businesses. So we have deep tech, tech transfer, and uh, ambition uh, and vision as yeah. the, the two leading categories. Ambition, ambition, ambition. So we did uh, our job well, I think, in hammering down that, in yeah. that point. Think bigger, be more ambitious, uh, and that's for every stakeholder group that's in the audience today. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that's, I would love to wrap it up at this point. So, Constantine, you can leave in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much, uh, Janneke, Dirk, Constantine, for your time today. And uh, we're going to be breaking out into more deep dive sessions. Um, one on funding unicorns, the next on Dutch LPs, another on scaling deep tech, and Janneke and Derek, you're going to be staying here with me to talk about employee ownership and options. Yes. Um, so time to ignite mm. and move on to our next phase. And good luck getting to your next room in 30 <laughs> seconds. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Let's Thank wrap you. it up what have we learned. This is our time. This is our turn. We're at the point of no return. Now take that spark and let it burn. It's time that we think big, pay it forward, take the risk. We can do this. We can do it if we want. But we have to come together. Government, startups, investors, let us put in all the effort. Let us make it through the desert. All these long days and nights, through the lows and through the highs. We will make our future bright. Let's unite to ignite.